talking today about King Richard III and his links to this, the town of Ludlow. Uh, quite famously, Richard's first steps onto the, the public political stage came at Ludlow with the Battle of Ludford in 1459 when he was just seven years old. He was abandoned here with his mother, his older brother George and their older sister Margaret when his father, Richard Duke of York, his older brothers, Edward Earl of March and Edmund Earl of Rutland, left Ludlow on the eve of the arrival of the King's army. Richard was left to witness the sacking of the town of Ludlow and the ransacking of his father's castle. And that must have left scars on a young seven-year-old boy who had expected the protection of his father and his older brothers. But Ludlow seems to have retained a place in Richard's heart. He definitely visited here again once more, uh, and possibly more than that. So I'll be looking at the links to Ludlow and also the impact that Richard's experiences at Ludlow had on the rest of his life, which of course ended famously on the field of the Battle of Bosworth in 1485. Um, but Richard III remains one of the most uh, controversial monarchs in English and British history. On the face of it at least, his story has very little to do with Ludlow or the Marches or the Mortimers. But I would argue that all of these elements had a greater impact on his life than you might think. And there is some evidence to support the view um, that, that he could have ended up as a, a Mortimer a March, a Lord at one point. Uh, I'm probably staying away from some of the most controversial moments in Richard's life, um, which is a nice comfortable position for me to be in for a change. Uh, and might actually allow me to keep to the half an hour. Um, so I'm really going to look at the ways in which this region uh, and Richard's experiences here helped to shape the man uh, and the king to some extent that he became. It was a, a long road from Ludlow to Bosworth for Richard, but I think he took plenty of baggage with him on that journey that he'd picked up here at Ludlow and found hard to put down. It's um, something maybe that, that many of us can probably identify with, and I think people often forget that men like Richard III were at the end of the day only human. Uh, they weren't unblemished heroes, but neither were they comprised wholly of evil. Hopefully examining a little bit about Richard's relationship with Ludlow here will help to flesh him out, flesh him out a little bit. Um, by the time the House of York reached Richard's generation, uh, an already powerful family had become the focus of a concentration of great families that would lead ultimately to the throne. The breadth of the makeup of Richard's heritage by this point is easy to overlook. Uh, of his four grandparents that we can see there, he has one member of the House of York, a Mortimer, a Neville, and a Beaufort. Four of the most powerful and influential families in 15th century England. Although the Mortimer name itself had all but fizzled out, this was the line upon which the House of York, as I mentioned earlier, had based its claim to the throne. The Neville family, reached their dizzying pinnacle and fell dramatically within Richard's own lifetime. And the Beauforts had become the deadly enemies of his father before their male line was ended in 1471 after the Battle of Tewkesbury. Yet Richard's mother was herself half Beaufort. And their descent from John of Gaunt had made them one of the most influential families during the Lancastrian period. All of this meant that Richard was descended from King Edward III via three of his four grandparents. Supposed to look much slicker. <laughs> um, Richard was the, the youngest surviving son, uh, the youngest surviving child, in fact, of Richard, Duke of York, and his wife Cecily Neville. He had three older brothers who survived and three older sisters. And when Richard was born on the 2nd of October 1452, his oldest sibling Anne was 13, Edward, Earl of March, was already 10, Edmund was 9, and Elizabeth was 8. Edward and Edmund were already installed here at Ludlow in their own household, a model that Edward would later recreate for his son, and which Edward's daughter would use once more for her son, Arthur. Closer in age to Richard were Margaret on the, on the right here, who was six, and George in the middle, who was almost three. And these were Richard's constant companions in the, the nursery, the Yorkist nursery at Fotheringay Castle. And it's perhaps important to understand that throughout the rest of his life, these were the two siblings that Richard was closest to in his childhood. In particular, he and George were to share trials that must have made their bond particularly strong, in turn making what followed between Edward and George all the more difficult for Richard to deal with. 
So as Richard Duke of York mustered his forces here at Ludlow, uh, making ready for his march to London in 1459, he decided that Fotheringay was no longer a safe enough place for his wife and his youngest children to remain. Cecily therefore brought Margaret, George and Richard with her here to Ludlow. Richard would pass his seventh birthday uh, on the 2nd of October 1459 amidst the preparations for a campaign that can only have been hugely exciting to such a little boy. He could watch soldiers pouring into the town, men practicing in the castle's outer bailey, supplies rolling into the camps, and this is perhaps the first time that we can, with any certainty, place all of the sons of the House of York in one place together. So it may have been the first time that Richard had met Edward and Edmund. And Richard could hardly fail to have been impressed by his mammoth oldest brother Edward. At seven, he could watch Edward, who was 17 and six foot four, practicing his skills at arms and hope that maybe one day he might be able to match his brother's physical prowess. Now, this was, after all, uh, many years before the scoliosis that would curve his spine curtailed any of those hopes. Any excitement at the building army and its departure from Ludlow was to be short-lived. The Yorkist army returned far too quickly to have, received, to have reached London and won any kind of victory. And word must have spread like, spread like wildfire, eventually reaching young Richard's ears, that the Royal Army was in hot pursuit of York's men and would be at Ludlow very soon. The Yorkist army threw up defensive earthworks in Ludford Meadow, just across Ludford Bridge, and held their breath waiting. On the 12th of October, Henry and his host appeared and made camp just outside the town, flying the royal banners that meant the king was leading the army and anyone opposing it would be deemed a traitor. As I mentioned before, York, during the night, with Salisbury Warwick, Edward and Edmund, withdrew from the castle, um, concluding that that was their only available option at the time. They couldn't rely on the men to fight the king, nor could they rely on the outcome of any battle. When the Calais garrison that Warwick had bought scaled the earthworks and fled into the arms of the king's pardon, um, taking with them any battle plans that they may have had and details of the defences that were there, it only made the situation all the more hopeless. As dawn broke on the 13th of October, the Yorkist soldiers rose to find that their commanders had left in the night. They quickly submitted to the king's mercy but Ludlow was punished for its support of York and his, and his opposition to the king. The town was ransacked as drunken royal soldiers ran amok, stealing wine and goods and raping women, women through the town. Although York and his two oldest sons had withdrawn, they had left behind Cecily, Margaret, George and the seven-year-old Richard. Even if adults could fathom the reasoning behind York's departure, I'm not so sure a little boy could. He'd been brought to Ludlow to be protected by his father and his two older brothers. He'd watched them preparing, no doubt enjoying being together uh, for possibly the first time. He'd watched them leave Ludlow to correct what they perceived to be the political wrongs dogging England. But within a few days they'd returned, the army had surrendered and Richard had been abandoned by his father, his two brothers, his uncle and his famous cousin Warwick and left to an army that was now tearing Ludlow apart. It was almost certainly calculated, and it turned out correctly, that York's wife and the young children would be protected rather than apportioned a share of the blame. But it must have still been frightening for a seven-year-old boy. Although, as Joanna mentioned, the legend that Cecily met the king at the Butter Cross with her sons is a much later addition. I've always wondered where Margaret was supposed to be in that too, if she was holding her two sons' hands. Nevertheless, the town was ransacked by the Royal Army and the castle the chroniclers recorded, was robbed to the bare walls. A psychological profile of Richard produced a few years ago suggested that he suffered from an intolerance to uncertainty. Uh, and it's easy to see his experiences at Ludlow in 1459 as the beginnings of some of this. When we see him acting decisively later in life to protect himself and his family, it is probably a direct consequence of the events that took place here built upon by later experiences in his life. It seems possible as well that Richard returned to Ludlow in 1470, 11 years after his last recorded visit. Um, this reference here comes from uh, the records of St Lawrence's Church right here, uh, although it's frustratingly undated. Uh, the best we can place it to is 1470 at the moment. But it records an offering made of 10 shillings from the Earl of Pembroke, 
and the entry that follows it is a note of a gift of a horse from the Duke of Gloucester worth four shillings and tenpence. Pembroke here was the young William Herbert whose father had just been executed after the Battle of Edgecote Moor. Now, the reason for tentatively dating it to 1470 lies partly in Richard's actions at the time. On the 16th of December 1469, aged 17, he was handed a commission granting him, uh, and quote, full power and authority to reduce and subdue the King's castles of Carmarthen and Cardigan in South Wales, which Morgan ap Thomas ap Griffith, gentleman, gentleman in inverted commas, uh, and Henry ap Thomas ap Griffith, also gentleman, uh, with other rebels, have entered into and from which they raid the adjacent parts, and to put them under safe custody and governance, and to promise pardon to such rebels within them as shall be willing to submit and take an oath of fealty. So essentially Richard was being sent to Carmarthen and Cardigan to kick these Welshmen out of castles that they used the, the unrest in England to seize. Um, but an interesting facet too of this, what was probably a test for Richard uh, in his king's, in the, his brother King Edward's service, was that Morgan and Henry uh, were the sons of, of Grufford ap Nicholas, um, a fairly well-known heavy-handed Welsh uh, bully at the time. Um, but Richard was being sent to regain Carmarthen and Cardigan Castle and take these men into custody. But another one of Grufford's sons uh, was named Rhys ap Thomas, uh, who was famously the man many believed to have dealt the fatal blow to Richard III at the Battle of Bosworth in 1485. It's possible to see that, I guess, as part of a, a vengeance against Richard for moving against his family in 1470. It certainly wasn't the only grudge that Richard was storing up during this period. He famously fell out fairly spectacularly with Thomas Lord Stanley around this time too. At the same uh, rough time, Richard also borrowed 40 pounds from John Carpenter, who was the Bishop of Worcester, um, suggesting again that he was in the area and that he was short of cash. Um, by this time, Richard's father had been dead for almost a decade and he might have wanted to visit Ludlow in remembrance of York. He seems to have been a sentimental man. Uh, we know that during his progress as king in 1483, he visited Tewkesbury, where he'd been involved with the, in the battle in 1471 uh, and where his brother George is buried. Perhaps passing through um, his father's old stronghold and the seat of the Mortimer Power and the location of a traumatic experience in his youth was a deliberate act of pilgrimage. Uh, there is another moment when I think Richard may possibly have planned to use the Yorkist connections to the Welsh marches. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, when Edward IV was driven into exile uh, and sailed from King's Lynn on the 2nd of October 1470, which was incidentally Richard's 18th birthday, uh, it was long believed that Richard had taken ship with him, um, but a discovery in the archives several years ago cast doubt on that. Um, it named several of the significant men who were with Edward at King's Lynn, including Lord Hastings and Anthony Woodville. Um, but Richard was not listed, and it would seem a, a glaring omission um, that suggests that perhaps he wasn't at King's Lynn getting on that ship. The young Duke did surface a little bit later in the Low Countries, um, so if he wasn't on Edward's ship, we're left wondering where he went before he crossed the sea. We do know that John Tiptoft, the Earl of Worcester, famously nicknamed the Butcher of England for executing men by having them impaled on stakes. He is known to have stayed behind in England as well. He was captured in the forest of Weybridge, about 50 miles southwest of King's Lynn. Uh, he faced mob justice there for his own excessive violence, but it seems likely that he was moving to lay the groundwork for Edward's planned eventual return. I wonder whether Richard himself didn't volunteer to stay behind for a similar reason. He could expect a fairly sympathetic hearing from George uh, or from Warwick if he was captured, which is more than tipped off hope for. It seems feasible, um, though obviously there's no evidence to support this idea, that Richard could have been heading west, possibly even heading here for Ludlow, to make sure that his brother's support remained strong and was prepared for his return. It's only a theory, but I think it's possible and it would demonstrate again Richard and the House of York's deep connection to the old port in the heartlands here in Shropshire. Uh, another reason to suspect that Richard might have retained uh, some affection for and a connection to this region <coughs> excuse me, is that he was very nearly based here, uh, or just south of here. Richard is remembered now as a great northern magnate holding the vast Neville inheritance centred on Middleham Castle in Yorkshire. Uh, but his move there followed the death of Richard Neville, the Earl of Warwick, at the Battle of Barnet in 1471. Before that vacuum appeared, 
Edward seems to have had very different plans for his youngest brother. In February 1468, the 15-year-old Richard appeared on the commissions of the Oye and Termine across the Midlands in Warwickshire, Worcestershire, Nottinghamshire, Derbyshire, Staffordshire, Shropshire and Herefordshire. <clears throat> At his age, um, these must have been fairly symbolic appointments, part of his training perhaps. But the regions which they were in were important. In August 1468, he received manors in Cornwall, confiscated from Eleanor, the Duchess of Somerset, followed in October, just after his 16th birthday, by more castles, manors and lordships in Somerset, Devon, Dorset, Wiltshire and up into Gloucestershire. In May 1469, Richard received properties from the Duchy of Lancaster's portfolio worth around £1,000 a year, a figure which seems to have represented what was deemed to be a sufficient amount for a young uh, nobleman or young royal man to support himself. <coughs> the grants also gave Richard land in five of the six hundreds of Lancashire and a barony in Cheshire. It placed him to, and perhaps intentionally at this point, into direct conflict with Thomas Lord Stanley. On the 29th of October 1469, the 17-year-old Richard was leading commissions of array in Shropshire, Gloucestershire and Worcestershire. On the 7th of November, he was made Chief Justice of North Wales and on the 14th of November, he was granted a castle and manor at Sudley in Gloucestershire. That would have seemed to have been an ideal base of operations for someone filling the void in the traditionally Lancastrian and Beaufort-dominated southwest and southern marches. With Edward in the southeast, George in the east and north Midlands, Warwick still nominally loyal in the north, it was, a per it was a gap that was perfect for Edward's little brother to fill. It was just after this, in December, that Richard was sent to restore order in Carmarthen and Cardigan. Had Warwick not fallen out spectacularly with Edward, it's possible that Richard would have been remembered as a powerhouse in the southwest and the marches, rather than in the north, but that possible future was swallowed up by the need to plug the hole left by Warwick in the north in 1471. And again, this is the image of Edward IV from the window behind you. Um, I think another one of the lingering effects uh, of, of Richard's brief time in Ludlow in 1459, uh, which was built upon in the following years, was the role models that he took for himself and tried to emulate in many ways. Physically, he seems to have wanted to be like his giant, ferocious oldest brother, Edward, who was originally Earl of March <clears throat> and later King Edward IV. At six foot four, Richard is still the tallest monarch in English or British history, and his reputation on the battlefield was the stuff of legend. Uh, to remain undefeated throughout the Wars of the Roses was no mean achievement. And I think in his performance at the Battle of Barnet, where he was injured, and at Tewkesbury, where he was carrying that injury, his disappointment during the French campaign in 1475 and in Scotland in 1482, we see a desperate desire in Richard to prove himself as a soldier, the equal of his brother. Perhaps the need also contributed to his fateful charge at the Battle of Bosworth. Politically though, I think Richard found little to admire in his big brother's lethargy, his late reactions and his blind eye to corruption. Uh, so again, here's York from the window behind you. <clears throat> and I think Richard's political role model was much more his father. This was perhaps allowed to develop um, by the loss of his dad at the age of eight. And like Edward, York could not live long enough for Richard to see him fail, allowing him to create a sense of, of perfection and hero worship around his dad. As king, some of Richard's first acts were to berate his brother's style of government and the corruption that it had involved, and return to something far more akin to his father's agendas of the 1450s, anti-corruption and pro-war with France. The politics of opposition is rarely the politics of the ruling party though, and Richard's attempts to reform Yorkist government met with some opposition from vested interests that York had, uh, sorry, the same uh, opposition from vested interests that York had faced in the 1450s. I actually think if you look at, at things like the October Rebellion during Richard's reign, you see that that's kind of what I would describe as a very middle class and very southern rebellion against Richard, who was in the, in the process of cutting off those kind of lines of corruption that allowed those people to buy their way into Edward IV's court. So although we, we quite often hear that the, the rebellion in October 1450, uh, sorry, 1483 uh, was based around disgust that Richard had probably murdered his nephews, the princes in the tower, I'd suggest it had 
much less to do with that than it had to do with his political activities and the fact that he was cutting off um, routes via corruption that these men had been enjoying and using for years. And we see Richard, uh, he writes to the bishops very early in his reign and tells them all that it's their responsibility to go out into the community and find those who need help and need to be brought back um, from corruption uh, and straightened out. So I think he very much saw his father um, as a political role model. Um, so although I think Richard isn't usually associated very closely with Ludlow, um, his experiences here left a mark on him uh, that contributed to the man that he became. Uh, the fear that security, no matter how safe it felt at the time, could be ripped away in a moment, remained with him and can be seen in some of his uh, dedications to saints who protected against sudden death. We have his visit to Ludlow in 1470, when it was not, not really on a direct route to Wales from where he was. And that suggests that even though it may have involved dark memories for him, it was a place that retained uh, a soft spot in his heart that he associated warmly with his family when it had been whole and together. It's perhaps fitting then um, to consider him under the gaze of his two greatest influences in the window up there, his brother King Edward and their father Richard Duke of York. Uh, and to allow that Richard wasn't altogether an evil man, but he was the sum of all his experiences, just as you and I are. Thank you very much. Apologies again. <laughs>